Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to get underway uh, with the session. Uh, just before I begin, I've just got a couple of housekeeping messages. Um, so, the first one is please visit the discussion space in the exhibition for the session. Uh, yeah, in the exhibition for the session, integrating hepatitis B responses into harm reduction, advocacy needs and actions at 3 p.m. Uh, we encourage you to participate in the poster tours that will begin at 3.10 p.m. today. You can collect headsets in the exhibition area and view the details of the tours in the handbook or conference app. And don't miss our final session today, supervised drug consumption facilities, examining the paradox. This will be in room D um, at 5.20 p.m. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Annie Madden and I'm a project lead at the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, uh, known as IMPUD, and I'm based in Sydney, Australia. Um, I'll let my co-chair introduce herself. <laughs> Good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Monica Chupaja. I'm the thematic focal point for drug use and HIV in the uh, UNODC uh, program on HIV. And we'd like to welcome you to this session uh, on drug use trends, policy and practice. Um, obviously, you know, it's such an important topic, particularly coming from a community perspective. I think the issue of policy data, good data and policy, policy is so critical to drive the kinds of reforms that we so desperately need in this space. And I think it's really important in forums like this one that we get to hear from people who are working in the policy space uh, to encourage us to think about issues differently and to elevate different issues and to support you all and give you other tools you can use in your conversations and the way that you do your advocacy and influence others. So um, without further ado, I think we'll get on to our fabulous speakers that we have here today. I'm gonna hand over um, to Monica to introduce our first speaker. So um, the first speaker is uh, Alexandra uh, Collis Brown from University uh, School of Public Health, uh, United States, and she will uh, talk about developing community-driven drug supply surveillance system in Rhode Island. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we unfortunately there is no time to talk about your uh, bio, but if you want to highlight something from your experience that you feel is important, please do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my name is Alex. Uh, I am a medical social scientist and community-based researcher based in uh, the United States. Um, just in the interest of time, I'll uh, go ahead and get started. But I do want to talk today about TestRI. So it's a community-driven drug surveillance pilot program that we implemented um, in our state uh, last year. Uh, just quickly, I do want to acknowledge this work is funded by the Foundations for Opioid Response Efforts, and we have no conflicts. So I think it's really important to kind of highlight the context in the United States. We've heard a lot um, of incredible work from across the globe uh, during this conference so far. But in the U.S., we have a really complex um, crisis on our hands. So in 2022, there were almost 110,000 fatal overdoses just in the United States, which is the highest number on record ever. Um, so we really are in an unprecedented time where we were starting to see a little bit of a plateau in fatal overdoses. And then when the COVID pandemic uh, started in 2020, we have seen this increasing spike year after year. So it really is time that we take more progressive and innovative steps in the U.S. to address um, these changing landscapes and better support folks who use drugs. Uh, just kind of briefly, the, the overdose crisis in the U.S., is, it's not new, it's just at it, it, unprecedented levels. Um, it really kind of started at the late 90s, early 2000s when we had uh, fatal overdoses really driven by prescription um, opioids, and then it transitioned into heroin, and then in the uh, kind of mid-2010s, we started seeing this increase um, driven by synthetic opioids like fentanyl. But we really now are in a bit of a fourth wave. So we're seeing um, an increase in polysubstance-related fatal overdoses, still really driven by fentanyl, but also this proliferation of other novel um, psychoactive substances in the supply. So what this really means is that 
to date, we haven't been responding in a way that's effective. Um, uh, we aren't, you know, things are changing in, at a pace that's not matched by our interventions and by our um, surveillance tactics in a way that helps us really respond um, more effectively to, to people uh, and people's needs. So when we think about drug supply surveillance in the US, it's um, essentially non-existent for, for the kind of broader context. There's usually kind of state to state um, own surveillance, but there's a lot of limitations to how drug supply surveillance is done in the US. A lot of the data comes from drug seizures, um, so things that are happening really at higher levels, uh, completely devoid of how people are experiencing substance use on the ground. Um, there's also kind of use, this use of leftover biospecimen data from um, hospital settings, so mostly this information can't go back to, uh, to patients because there was no consent involved to actually using this to, um, for drug uh, surveillance purposes or there's the use of post-mortem toxicology data. So things are really delayed. Um, reporting methods uh, and, and testing methods aren't uh, incredibly comprehensive and don't really engage with folks who use drugs in any capacity. So that's really kind of the impetus for our um, project was to fill this gap while making sure that we're also talking to people who use drugs and folks who support them on the ground. Um, so this study does take place in Rhode Island. So it's the tiniest of the states in the United States. Our population is just over a million people. But you can see for a million people, we have been incredibly impacted by the overdose crisis, having more than one person die of a fatal overdose each day in the last several years. The yellow bars are fentanyl-driven overdoses, so it really has taken over the drug supply locally. Uh, just briefly, um, test our eye. So we launched in May 2022. Um, it really has been guided by the input of folks who use drugs and community partner agencies that are in housing, harm reduction, and addiction medicine um, spaces. It includes uh, kind of longitudinal qualitative um, interviews with folks who use drugs at baseline in six months, um, observational field work toxicology testing of donated samples, and then our kind of key piece is really working to disseminate findings in a more rapid time frame to people um, in the study as well as people in the community. Um, the samples that we're collecting, most are donated by participants. Um, this includes everything from used paraphernalia to refuse like baggies or foil, um, and also product. We are collecting um, where the participant purchased it, as well as what they uh, think that they had reported buying. And then we're testing everything on an LCQTOF MS. So this is a liquid chromatography quadruple time of flight mass spec. Um, it is a very comprehensive lab-based um, technology. So it's not point of care um, in the community. These are all being taken to uh, our local hospital for testing. Um, people can also donate it more anonymously, so that we're working with community partners and they have um, clients who come in who aren't part of the study but do uh, want to know what's in their um, supply that they've purchased. So just briefly, um, before I talk about how we're disseminating stuff, I thought it'd be helpful to kind of highlight what we're seeing um, in our state. So half of what we've tested has been actual product. Um, and then about 40% has been paraphernalia. But you can see that um, most of the samples we're testing have been sold as fentanyl, and then it ranges everything from ketamine to Adderall, um, clonopin. Uh, we've had one sample that was sold as fentanyl xylazine, so we've really tried to get a, this diverse um, uh, spectrum of, of substances to really kind of paint this uh, overarching picture of, of the local supply. Um, some kind of key findings I wanted to just touch on is that, uh, so we've, we've tested 182 samples to date, and about 40% did contain xylazine. So this is a veterinary sedative. Um, it's seen it in the United States really kind of take hold of supplies in um, Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, but we hadn't seen it in Rhode Island yet. So we started, uh, it was not being tested for at the state level. And so we've started seeing uh, this kind of uptick in the local supply. Um, and then 67% of samples have con uh, contained fentanyl. I do want to note, though, that in our testing, xylazine was only found alongside fentanyl. And we've only had one sample that was sold as uh, containing this. So for most people, this was completely new. No one had heard of it. 
um, prior to the study. And so it really kind of uh, underscored this, this rapidly changing environment that we needed to be able to respond to. Um, of the stimulant samples, these are also quite complex, and a lot of them, 38% uh, did contain fentanyl and 15% contained xylazine as well. So this also really highlighted this need to, in our state, a lot of messaging has really focused on people who use opioids, but we know that a lot of times substance use is, is polysubstance use, and there was this need to really reach out to folks who use stimulants. We've also found uh, novel benzodiazepines in several samples and um, nitazines in six samples as well. So what have we done with this information? Um, kind of a key partner on this is our state's health department. Uh, they run an overdose surveillance dashboard um, along with uh, scientific advisors in this, the, um, our university. But this has been really important. This has a really wide reach. It's not just in the state, it's um, across the US. But they uh, were able to work with us, and we have a dedicated web page that we update in real time as our findings come in. Um, so it's gotten pretty decent visibility. Um, people are spending time kind of scrolling through. And this is where we keep all of our, it's essentially a big repository of all of the um, information. And so we wanted to make sure all of our participants get notified if they've donated a sample via text or phone or um, meeting them in person, whatever they want to go over what was in the results. And we also disseminate to outreach workers, but we wanted to make sure we were reaching people who may not be fully connected to uh, other services. And so we wanted to make sure this was a, a more widespread dissemination approach as well. Um, so we, this uh, chart gets updated and populated as soon as results are confirmed in the lab. Um, so you can search by different substances, what things were sold as, different cities, and we have been able to um, highlight kind of major substances. We don't use uh, quantification. It's all kind of, uh, it's all qualitative um, tox results, but it's been really helpful, I think, for people to be able to look and also see that there are a lot of um, variability in the supply no matter where people are purchasing in the state. We also have a glossary that's updated so people can learn more about different substances. And then we also provide these local supply updates, all of which are, are housed in a repository on this website. And so these are um, two-sided. So we just pick a couple samples from a month. These go out uh, usually twice a month. And it really um, is to just give people a little bit of an overview. And these are also printed and translated into Spanish and Portuguese and uh, distributed in the community and to our community partner organizations. Um, and then we also do a little bit of substance spotlight. So these are things that people are raising more concerns about or that we're starting to see, like nitazines. And we do a little bit of a deep dive into what that means and why people should uh, be mindful that it's in the supply. So these go out, again, uh, bro broadly in the community and then also to providers, um, healthcare providers. Um, my favorite part, I think, of dissemination are the zines that um, have been created by uh, two of the people on the team, um, Claire Macon and Abdullah Shahipar. This has been a really great way of having information in a more arts-based form that's really focused on the community. Um, this, these all get kind of workshopped with our community advisory board. Um, again, we translate them and distribute them widely. And it really has been helpful, I think, for people to see this information in a different form. We've gotten really great feedback, um, and we've been able to iterate as the, the zines go on to make them more and more accessible um, based on the feedback we've provided, or we've received, sorry. Um, and then lastly, we also were able to send out provider advisory updates through the state's Department of Health um, uh, portal. This is to all licensed um, healthcare providers, uh, Peer, report, uh, peer support recovery specialist, um, really anybody in the state with some type of license and affiliation with the Department of Health. And so these are just kind of updates really to, for, for folks to be um, aware of. And then we post things on social media as well. And I wanna just highlight a couple outcomes. So this really was a pilot project um, to kind of build a, a larger surveillance system, but you know, things that have come out of this, has been it's been really exciting to see uh, 
the downside is that we do have xylazine, but it's really kind of spurred this mo movement at the state level to respond. Um, so this has been from the state's Department of Health providing more funding to local organizations to build wound care kits, to do trainings on street-based wound care, um, and really has been this push to get xylazine test strips and a lot of um, incredible uh, services that we hadn't seen before. There's also been this push um, across the board at the community level on educating around xylazine, but also press pills and working specifically with folks who predominantly use stimulants to talk about different harm reduction techniques as well. And this has also led to one of our community partners purchasing um, an FTIR to do um, in-house drug checking at their uh, OTP. So really this was, they had a lot of clients who were involved in our study who were really interested in learning more. So they wanted to bring this in-house and really launch this at the community level. Um, I do wanna just acknowledge that we're able to do this work in Rhode Island because we do have the legalization of drug checking um, services, which is not the case across the U.S., so there really is this need to expand these types of services, um, both at the community level and also at the, the state level. And I just want to quickly acknowledge all of our partners, all the participants, and all the staff who've made this work possible. Thank you. Oh, great, thanks, Alexandra. That um, was really interesting. I just think um, a lot of the drug alerts work and prompt response initiatives just become so much more critical in those really rapidly changing environments. And great to see some of the work that is being done around community-led uh, solutions to some of the, the issues that are being uncovered through the surveillance systems. So um, excellent work. Uh, okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, um, Matthew Bond from the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs, um, from Canada, of course, um, and he will be presenting on 2.5 grams, I could do that before noon, people who use drugs, perspectives on the impacts of British Columbia's decriminalisation of illegal drugs threshold limits. Thank you, Annie. Um, and I should just acknowledge that um, this work was done while I was with the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs, but I'm currently employed with the Canadian AIDS Society, and um, it's uh, work I'm presenting on a team of authors uh, led by Dr. Faria Ali. So I'm just uh, one of uh, the co-authors on this published study. So I wish to acknowledge that the land on which we collectively worked on this research project as it has spread across all of Turtle Island. For, across, for a thousand of years, white settlers brutally ripped away the very land on which a lot of us work on today, and we have to continuously be doing more to try and ever repair the damage of our ancestors inflicted. Today, all of the authors I am here representing still call home to the very land which we stole, which we would uh, always acknowledge, and not only to acknowledge, but try our best to make the same mistakes our ancestors made against the many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work, play, and share this land with our fellow, fellow indigenous people. So uh, just a couple of disclosures. I have to uh, disclose that I have personal fees from AbbVie and outside of the submitted work and personal and grant fees from Gilead. And. Um, just some conflicts uh, uh, from all of my wonderful authors. So the funding from which we received this came from the Canadian Institute for Health Research for the Ontario CRISM node. Uh, the funding source had no role in the design of this study nor its execution analysis, interpretation of the data or the publication. And I also um, have to acknowledge that I spent time in a provincial jail, so that could con be considered as a conflict as well. So this is published in the Substance Abuse Treatment Prevention and Policy Journal uh, earlier this year. Two and a half grams, I could do that before noon. I, I picked that title, I, I seen that, and I just said that's got to be the title. Um, it, it just reflects the limitations on a lot of the, the decrim analysis or the decrim policy that's being implemented in BC. So just some context in British Columbia and Canada. Um, they implemented a pilot project to decriminalize um, multiple substances 
but the threshold limit is two and a half grams. So you can only have two and a half grams of all these substances combined. Um, the substances include cocaine, opioids, uh, methamphetamines, um, but they exclude drugs such as benzos and um, other like uh, novel synthetic drugs such as xylazine and whatnot. So there's a lot of limitations on this, uh, on the policy. So um, we recruited people from a pre-existing cohort of uh, 200 people from which the Ontario CRISM node uh, did a, a national qualitative study. Um, you know, having kind of the, the, the precarious nature of drug use, you know, you, you don't always have that connection with people and people are lost to follow up. So we, we connected with other um, cohorts through the Dr. Peter AIDS Foundation. Uh, the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, the BCCSU, and the BCCDC. So with their support, we had uh, a total of 45 people who used drugs participate in this present study. Uh, and people were contacted via um, the, the study email, and then they were connected on through a, a telephone, and they were a qualitative analysis was done through um, a, a telephone. So the eligibility criteria for our population was ev everybody had to be 18, eight, 18 years or older, currently use, using illegal substances in Canada, uh, not including cannabis since it's legal in Canada, and at least weekly engaged in opioid agonist therapy, and currently reside in BC and speak and comprehend uh, English. So once we... Um, talked to the 45 people, we, we did a descriptive qualitative thematic analysis, um, ident identifying different themes and pulling quotes from, from those themes, which I'll um, talk about. Um, we transcribed all the, the, the interviews through um, uh, the data software Navivo and uh, coded them with a Dr. Faria Ali coded common responses and, and uh, various different uh, themes that emerged from those, um, from the interviews. So once the final code book was completed, uh, independent coder Kaylee Russell uh, randomly selected a subsample, 20% of the transcripts to review, and an average of 80, 81% was calculated to be sufficient with the initial coder. So just some of our uh, demographics from the 45 people. Uh, we looked at age groups, sex, uh, ethnicity, if they're on o opioid agonist therapy or safe supply. Safe supply included individuals who are receiving drugs, either opioids or stimulus through a prescription program. Um, their living situation and if they were remote or if they were living remote or rural or in an urban setting. Uh, so the majority of people uh, were in this age group of between 31 and 50. Uh, it was a pretty even split between male and female with 24 males, 20 females, and one person identifying as a non-binary person. Uh, ethnicity was, um, we didn't get as many African, Caribbean, and black people as we would like, but we did have one person, 17 indigenous people, and 27 uh, white people. And on safe supply or not on safe supply, um, or on OAT or, or safe supply, 24 said yes, uh, 20 said, 21 said no. Uh, if they were li their living situation, um, 29 were stably housed, which is uh, ironic seeing the, 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 the housing crisis in BC. Um, but you know, just how we follow up with people, you know, it, it makes sense. Um, Eight people were unstably housed, uh, so in individuals either that were living kind of couch, couch surfing or, you know, just kind of didn't have a, a stable house, and eight people identified as living homeless, um, and we had 41% uh, identified as an urban setting and only four as a remote and rural, and we would have liked to see more people in the rural and remote area.
So their substance use, um, 24% uh, or 24 people identified as poly substance users. Um, 9% or 9 people uh, identified as just stimulant users and 12, 12 people identified as uh, just opioid users. And the frequency of use, uh, 35 people identified as the da daily use and that's, you know, the, the individuals that we really would like to see uh, and talk to. Uh, and 10% or 10 people talk, we talked to are, were weekly substance users. So uh, with the qualitative results, um, we have uh, we have uh, results outlined uh, below and are narratively reported under two categories: uh, implications for substance use profiles and purchasing patterns, including implications on the cumulative nature of the threshold and the impacts of bulk purchasing, and implications of police enforcement, including distrust of police. You, of police use of discretion, potential for net widening, and potential for jurisdictional discrepancies in enforcing the threshold. So uh, a quote for implications for substance use profiles and purchasing patterns. I think it's okay for people who are living minute to minute at, for living minute at a time, surviving a minute at a time to their next hit who can't afford to buy larger and spread it out just because they're so marginalized with poverty and don't have the means. They're just trying to survive and support their habits. So when so somebody's put in that situation, they're literally surviving. And that came from a female uh, age 40 who identified as an indigenous person. I like this quote. Um, this one's about uh, the threshold limit. Uh, again, it's a weird number that they chose because it's not an amount that people most buy. It's an amount that just seems arbitrary because like, it doesn't make sense why they choose two and a half grams because a lot of people buy eight balls, which is three and a half grams. It just really seems so strange that they chose two and a half grams. And I, I completely agree and I think it's a completely arbitrary law. Uh, and that came from a male, age 30, person, uh, an indigenous person. So we've got a couple uh, quotes for the implications for bulk purchasing. I would use just under two grams, a half a ball a day, so that means I'd have to buy every day in order to keep under the laws, which is more expensive. And that came from a male, age 52, a white person. And, and uh, a quote from the implications of police enforcement. There's cops out there that are real jerks who would love to just bust anybody with the smallest amount. Just so they have them wait all week, like they bust them on a Friday and they make them sit in cells detoxing all week, which could send somebody into acute withdrawal and close to dying. And that came from a, a male age 41 who was white. And another huge concern is the potential for net widening. So uh, potential for net widening effect was a specific concern for participants who suggested it, who, who would disproportionately impact the dealers and suppliers who they trusted to provide them with an unadulterated supply. So the fear was that the police officers may start targeting drug trafficking, which would result in increased risk of overdose and harms for people who use drugs if their trusted dealers were arrested. Um, and it's a, a pretty, um, pretty impactful quote. Who I worry about is the dealers, and if I have a dealer that I've established a relationship with and I know his stuff and he knows me and what I like and we've got a really good report and I've got some consistency finally, that's actually keeping me safe. But if he gets busted and he goes to jail, then somebody else is gonna take his place. And generally what ends up happening is that somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing doesn't have the same experience, isn't gonna have the same quality of supply that I'm used to, probably gonna be more weird dope floating around for a while, like there was early on in the pandemic. It's just more dangerous. That's what I worry about the most. I, I think it actually puts us more at risk as if our dealers are getting busted. And that came from a female age 37 who identified as a white person. And there's also a concern of uh, this jur jurisdiction 
jurisdictional discrepancy. So if, you have, if you're living in the, a remote or rural area uh, in BC, they may enforce this law differently, which you know we, we've seen this happen with overdose prevention sites or, or remote rural communities will ban um, public drug consumption, which goes completely against the law. Uh, but, you know, this came from a, a male age 66 white person. The downtown east side of Vancouver, the small amounts of dopes have pretty, be, pretty well been legalized anyway. But again, it's the arbitrary, all drug laws are arbitrary. You can have two people standing next to each other, both have dope on them, the police know and is going to arrest the fucker he don't like. Which is so true. So I think it's really important to, you know, just to acknowledge that, you know, if you're going to look at different uh, avenues of decriminalization, that the threshold limits need to be uh, appropriate and, and two and a half uh, grams, um, there's, there's a significant amount of limitations on that threshold quantity. Uh, participants in our study proposed a number of factors that may undermine the effectiveness of the two and a half gram threshold, such as the continued need to purchase substances in smaller quantities, which has the potential to be stomped or contaminated with other substances, thus potentially increasing the overdose risk. Uh, the implementation and enforcement of the policy, and the, particularly of the two and a half gram threshold, will likely be the utmost importance when evaluating whether the policy is meeting its uh, proposed objectives as the threshold will be used to delineate between the two, those who will be criminalized versus those who will not. Currently, there is no publicly available information regarding what types of information police will take into consideration when deciding what amount above the two and a half gram threshold will be considered possession for personal use versus tra trafficking and whether a criminal or health response will be taken. Uh, so, you know, a lot, a lot of study participants, people who use drugs and their allies have called for a more hands-off approach uh, when talking about decriminalization of drug use, uh, citing major concerns in relation to the police of their, their use of discretion as it stands in the policy, especially with the two and a half gram threshold limit. Therefore, police knowledge on decriminalization and its goals as well as training will likely play a, a direct role on how police apply their, their, their discretion during the enforcement of the policy. And you know, although we made our best efforts in, to include participants from a wide variety of backgrounds, geographic locations, and substance use patterns and experiences, we recognize that participants do not represent all people who use drugs in BC. And due to our recruitment strategies, there may be some bias towards those who are more integrated and connected with the harm reduction service, services and advocacy, advocacy groups through which we recruited uh, participants. So as BC has just implemented on a monumental shift in drug policy from decades of criminalization to the decrim to, of criminalization to decriminalization with a public health lens, the proposed threshold limit and how it's implemented and enforced by law enforcement will have a substantial impact on people who use drugs. This will play a huge role and dictate whether the policy is a success. Participants in this study indicated that the two and a half gram threshold limit as it stands may increase the risk of drug related harm such as overdose and arrest. So going against what the, the, the policy is trying to actually do. As the policy unfolds, it will be vital to monitor and, evalu and evaluate the impacts of the threshold limit to ensure it does not further the harms to people who use drugs. And just uh, on behalf of my, my authors, Dr. Faria Ali, Kaylee Russell, Dr. Alyssa Greer, Dr. Dan Werb, and Dr. Jorgen Wren. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Um, actually, uh, you know, the perspectives of the community uh, are, are so important in, in these aspects. I mean, you know, we have uh, the uh, global aid strategy and the um, uh, political declaration on AIDS that is setting these targets of, uh, in by you know, in one year and a couple of months, only 10% of the countries. Uh, in the world, less than 10% will have uh, punitive laws and uh, practices uh, that are affecting 
uh, people uh, from the key population, including people who use drugs. And uh, the criminalization of the uh, use and uh, uh, possession for the personal use are one of the things that uh, are mentioned there as uh, uh, things that needs to be changed. So, uh, but then from over 190 countries in the world who are reporting injecting drug use, 50 of them have some form of decriminalization, but in many of them the community was not consulted and therefore the, the changes in the legislation are not eliminating completely the barriers uh, for, for people who use drugs. And this uh, takes us to the next topic, uh, which is uh, actually I'm also very <laughs> curious to, to hear. What is drug policy research? And we'll hear um, uh, about this from Alison Ricker from U University of New South Wales, uh, Australia. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for coming along to the session. Um, it was probably hard for the organisers to work out where to put this paper, um, so I'm not sure where it would fit, but I'm here to talk about drug policy research. As the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Drug Policy, you'd think I'd know, um, but actually it's not so easy, and I could have an hour on this topic and still not cover everything. There's no actual formal definition of policy, there's obviously no singular definition or approach for research, and there's no definition of drug. I'm actually not going to talk about the definition of drug, but I would remind people that drugs include alcohol, nicotine, ecstasy, psychedelics, LSD, new psychoactive substances, cocaine, crystal methamphetamine, and of course heroin, and then um, pharmaceutical opioids, and that's not all of them. Um, and with the journal, we do debate whether medicinal cannabis is actually a drug or is that a medicine? And does medicinal cannabis work belong in the International Journal of Drug Policy? Happy to talk about that um, out of session. So I'm going to talk about a definition of policy and a definition of research. So when we think about policy, what's the first thing that pops into people's heads? You'll all have a definition already. So the one that most commonly gets stated is that policy is a formal, are the formal decisions of government, that they're, they're the sort of the statements of intent, if you like. They're the laws and the regulations, as Matt's been describing to us. They're the strategic frameworks or the action plans, and they're other documented policies. But actually, that's only one definition of policy. A second sees policy as a set of actions or processes. And in this sense, it's the funding decisions that matter. So you can have a policy that says, you know, we support needle syringe programs, but if you don't actually fund any, then, you know, you're evaluating a policy that's actually absent. And implementation actions are fundamentally important. I've put Uruguay up here just to remind people about recreational cannabis being legalised in Uruguay. Uruguay established three mechanisms for the availability of uh, cannabis, recreational cannabis, but only two of those mechanisms were actually implemented, and the third is progressively being rolled out. But if you coded Uruguay as a place where recreational cannabis was legal, which it is technically according to their, their legislation, um, it's a very different picture from the states in the US, for example. And there's some fantastic work by Michael Lipsky called Street Level Bureaucrats, written in the 1980s, about how actually policy is implemented by street level workers. So you are all policy makers and the community are policy makers by exercising judgment, discretion, by um, providing services, um, a very expansive definition of policy. And I'll also refer you to the theories around policy being made in practice. It's a fabulous book by an anthropologist, Tess Lee. It's called Wild Policy. She talks about um, the policy with Aboriginal um, communities in Australia. Um, and of course, our very own Kari Lancaster and Tim Rhodes with evidence-making interventions where policy is actually made in practice. And then, of course, there's the third definition, which comes from the governmentality literature, which is basically policy is not about formal government um, decisions or intentions or actions. 
but it's all the ways in which power and control are exercised in people's lives and taking a governmentality perspective. So you can already begin to see that we can't even agree on what policy is, and it is all of these things, depending on where you come from. So what is research? <laughs> Um, so there are multiple disciplines, there's multiple theoretical foundations and approaches, but what I've tried to do here is classify five types of policy research. Policy formation research, policy positions, policy implementation, policy outcomes and effects. Each of these bring different research questions, different foundation, theoretical foundations and methods, and they also vary based on the three definitions of policy that I gave earlier. So policy formation research understands policy formation as a complex dynamic um, with a system of intersecting actors, ideas and institutions. And this is very much focused on the processes. For example, the role of evidence, the role of public opinion, who had a seat at the table, who participated, was there representation from community. And the classic research question in this is, how did this policy proposal come to be selected? This is really important research to tell us how policy comes about and why often bad choices are made. Um, there are two really good policy process theories. One of them is called multiple streams. The other is called the advocacy coalition framework that um, provide a theoretical framework to analysing how policy gets made. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of research methods, ethnography, qualitative research, SNA. And I am using this to highlight some of my work. Um, this is a paper we published that uses the advocacy coalition framework and multiple streams um, to examine, this is in relation to the, the use of drug detection dogs or sniffer dogs outside music festivals. But the other example I had is actually a paper from Annie Madden um, on um, drug user representation in high level policy settings, which I strongly commend to you as a fantastic example of research on representation and uh, who gets a seat at the table, but it's much more nuanced than, than just that. So the second type of research, which is, a, which is a bit what Matt has presented to you, is studying what the policies actually are. Um, can I remind this particular audience that drug policy is really broad, it's laws, it's treatment, but it's also prevention, it's obviously harm reduction, it's also policing, it's also supply control. Um, and, you know, the types of questions we might ask are how many countries have this kind of policy, what level of support or opposition does the policy enjoy, and how strong is the evidence? And I'm, I've actually, the example I've chosen is one that Matt's a co-author on, um, led by Alyssa Greer, some work we did on the BC decriminalisation. And Matt's extending that work of studying policy positions with the analysis, the qualitative analysis of the 2.5 grams. I would note that in Australia it's one gram. So if you're worried about 2.5, don't come down under. The third type is um, policy implementation. Policy implementation requires a cast of characters, environments, barriers and enabling factors. And the key questions are things like, was the policy actually implemented? You'd be surprised how many policies actually don't get implemented. Um, did the policy operate as intended in practice? And what were the barriers and facilitators? There's some really good theoretical foundations for this kind of work. Implementation Sciences, the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research are two examples. And the piece of work that I was using here is some work, um, one of our jurisdictions in Australia legalised uh, small quantities of recreational cannabis but in a very weird way. And so this is work we did with people who are growing cannabis um, in, uh, in Canberra and how that's going for them. The title gives a hint, Navigating the Grey. Um, it's a very blurry legal area. The fourth type is policy outcome research. This asks the question, did the policy achieve its desired outcomes? So was it effective? Was it cost effective? Do the positive outcomes outweigh the unintended negative consequences? Clearly, the most of this work comes from a positivist, positivist framework. Um, it looks at efficacy, randomised controlled trials, effectiveness um, in the real world, 
a bunch of health economics, cost effectiveness, cost utility, cost benefit. Um, and then there are important study designs like difference in difference and time series analyses, which are often used to evaluate policy outcomes. And the piece of work is an example from um, one of my PhD students, Tu Vung. It's a cost effectiveness of um, centre-based compulsory treatment compared to methadone in Vietnam. No prizes for guessing that voluntary methadone maintenance is significantly more cost effective than compulsory centre-based treatment. And the last is studying the effects of policy. So this is different from the outcomes. This comes from a particular theoretical premise that policies are expressions of power. They contain within them representations of how drugs and drug problems are thought about, how people who use drugs are regarded, and the acceptable solutions. The effects of policy include their discursive effects and their subjectification effects. The theoretical foundations for this work come from postmodernism and post-structuralism, work like Carol Backey's What's the Problem Represented to Be, and it uses critical theory. And the example I've chosen here is in relation to wastewater, its work with Kari and Tim, um, looking at the social and ethico-political effects of uh, wastewater analysis. So bringing it all together, we've got policy as statements of government intent, really important to study those. We've got policy as actions, actions of government and of funders, we need to study those. And policy as power and from a governmentality perspective. And then within that, we can have these five different foci, if you like, for um, ways of studying policy. And our research approaches span positivist through to postmodern, post-structural. And that is the joy of the International Journal of Drug Policy and why I love my role as Editor-in-Chief. Just wanted to draw two conclusions. Firstly, I've presented some really neat categories. I'm a researcher after all. However, the world doesn't actually fall into these neat categories and much research doesn't just be one. But I think one of the take-homes is to understand what kind of policy research you're doing, what your definition of policy is, know what the object is that you are studying, firstly, and which perspective you bring. And secondly, where are you in that policy? Are you looking at its formation? Are you looking at its outcomes, its effects, its implementation? And being clear about that, I think, really helps situate um, your policy research. My second take home is that we have huge gaps in drug policy research. Um, remembering INSU has a particular interest in hepatitis C and harm reduction, but that actually is a very small part of drug policy research and the drug policy research terrain. Um, and the research is really lopsided. So we've got actually a lot of research and fantastic stuff presented throughout this conference on harm reduction and on treatment as two important drug policy pillars. But I've got to say, we've got bugger all on laws and law enforcement and supply control and policing. And as long as we continue to focus on the things that we feel passionate about, we're not generating the evidence that policymakers feel passionate about. And so we need to do more research on the areas that policymakers think are their best bets not the ones that we think are the best bets. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Alison, that was great. Um, I know as one of Alison's previous PhD students, she, um, she was one of my, my supervisors and she made me think very deeply, as you can imagine, about some of these questions and issues in my research, and I think this is, it's so critical to ask these questions. I accept, Alison, this, your presentation probably was a little different to some of the others here, but I think it's so important to have these presentations and encourage people to think about what policy is, how it comes into being, and its effects, particularly if we hope to have an impact on the types of policies being made. It's very important that we take the time to look behind the curtain, so to speak. So um, I'll move with that, I'll move on to our next speaker, um, which is Martin Bastian from the Umarse University. Um, and Martin's going to speak to us about cannabis use to manage other psychoactive substances consumption, 
a mixed methods survey in France. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to present you a part of my PhD work on cannabis use, um, self-medication, and harm reduction practices. So, to introduce my speech, uh, it was at the beginning of my PhD. Uh, we have been contacted by two community-based associations. They told us about a practice they were observing for decades among cannabis users that several cannabis users uh, made the choice to reduce the use of other substances by replacing by um, cannabis. Um, it could be for alcohol, benzodiazepine, antalgic opioids, illegal stimulants, etc. Uh, and no scientific or medical doctor was taking it seriously, so they wanted to conduct a survey to talk about this. And as it was perfectly fitting my PhD topic, I was like, okay, let's do this. Um, so together, we conducted a study, a small study without, uh, without any fundings. Um, so this study relies on the, um, the hypothesis of the lifestyle drug substitution strategy that says that uh, people who use drugs are able to, um, to estimate benefits and harms of substances and adopt conscious strategies so cannabis could be used as an alternative to other substances like alcohol, illegal substances, or prescribed medications, according to the, the effects and the safety they are looking for. Um, the objectives were to, um, were to study this practice among frequent cannabis users in France and to um, explore characteristics, drug use patterns, perceptions of benefits and harms, and treatment experience. We use a mixed methodology with first an online questionnaire survey. We recruited to community social medias. The um, criteria were to live in France and explicitly being concerned by the use of cannabis to reduce, stop, or to manage other psychoactive substances, prescribed or not. Then, uh, at the end of the questionnaire, we proposed a qualitative interview if they were interested to tell about their experience and their opinions. The criteria were to, um, to be frequent and current cannabis user. The interviews were online or in person. The advantage of online interviews is to easily recruit people all around the territory, even in small villages with internet connection. Uh, and I use a um, thematic guide interviewed based on the previous questionnaire results. So I don't have the time to present all of the results. Um, we had uh, 230 respondents. Uh, they were mainly men uh, of all ages. It was a quite specific profile of cannabis users um, because 74% reported using cannabis daily. 60 26% um, reported uh, home cultivation and 13% uh, reported non-smoked uh, as main route of administration. This is huge compared to general population surveys on cannabis use. Um, one third reported uh, replacing more than one substance and between 23 and 59% consulted a health professional for dependence, specifically for opiates and benzos. So um, that let me suppose that some problematic uses started following a medical prescription. Um, between 63 and 78% declared um, having already reduced or stopped the substance thanks to cannabis. For the um, qualitative results, I uh, present you the 10 interviews with participants from the survey. Um, while describing their use of cannabis, they showed negative experiences and perceptions uh, associated with drug use and health care, like adverse effects with drug or treatments, or fear or adverse effects. They show the willingness to manage craving when they reduce the use of the drug. Um, to substitute uh, treatments, they find less efficient or more harmful. Often it's both. They also showed some loss of confidence in conventional medicine. Associated with the practice I'm talking about, the participants showed drug consumption strategies 
Um, for example, they are anticipating different cannabis effects, knowing how to get the beneficial effects and how to prevent the negative effects. They are planning and scheduling their consumptions in the time when, um, in the space, where and with who, and what product, what dose, um, what cannabis concentration also, what potency, I mean. Um, for cannabis, but also sometimes in combination with other medications. And they also pay attention about the way to get cannabis, how to get cannabis, and about the quality of cannabis products. And then um, to get into this practice, they developed skills and knowledge. They have access to technical and scientific knowledge through internet, books, um, about pharmacology, medicine, botanic also, the, um, that they combine with their experience-based knowledge. And they share information, drug tips, with com the community in forum discussions, uh, in association, also one participant in a cannabis social club. To conclude, um, don't expect too much. This use of cannabis is not a clinical use and is not suitable for clinical treatments. Cannabis is not for, uh, suitable for everyone. We don't have high vid scientific evidence to support it uh, as a clinical intervention. But this study better shows the diversity and complexity of lived, ex lived experience. Um, with drug use, some of them have uh, dependence, uh, others don't have. Uh, some have uh, medical use, others have um, recreational use, and often it's a mix of all of them. Um, with also uh, the complexity of lived experience with healthcare, some have no healthcare experiences, some have a very bad experience with healthcare and prefer to do, to do it by themselves. And others, for others, conventional medicine, medicine is still here and is complementary. <coughs> and also with uh, cannabis-related motives, they may look for a way to self-medicate symptoms, for enhancement for work or activities, for pleasure, and a blurred boundaries between all of them. It is too diverse to speak about one specific practice. It is rather a set of harm reduction and healthcare practices. It is important, I guess, in terms of empowerment and uh, autonomy for people who use drugs, because we must acknowledge that, that they are already adopting self-care practices, even if they think they don't have control over the drug use. And we must acknowledge the role of community-based supports in a productive context and when um, adequate information are not very available, the community may be helpful to reduce harms. Finally, I presented you 10 interviews following the questionnaire, but actually my plan is to continue the qualitative interviews with others, uh, other sources of recruitment in order to diversify the profiles of frequent chemist users and to study the link between the use of cannabis and the use of other substances. Thank you. If you have a question, uh, we can meet at lunch. Thank you very much. Look, I mean, we're almost uh, at the time when we need to finish, but I hope you will stay with us a little bit longer because we have very interesting uh, presentations to come. Just uh, obviously the time for questions uh, has uh, gone, uh, and please don't put the questions in the app because even if any and I are very high tech, this tablet is dead. So <laughs> please, so so uh, Claudia uh, Bernardini from Arut, Switzerland, is talking about SESU, an interdisciplinary uh, project on sexual uh, sexualized uh, substance use. Sexual. So hello everybody. I'm going to present a model of care, an interdisciplinary project we started in Arut. Uh, so background is the, the sexualized substance use. 
that's uh, the practice of psychotropic substance used before or during sex to incre increase sexual pleasure. That means we were not focusing only on chem sex as known, so with a certain sexual orientation, but we were open to check in, in every situation, so men, women, trans men, trans women, so we were checking for all. The substances are also not obligatory, the one of chem sex, I will come later on that. So the point, uh, the idea is that there is a correlated stigma uh, that uh, with substance use and with sex. And that delays the possibility of the patients to reach help to choose a way for arm reduction. So there's also a lack of clear guidelines in that, except maybe for chem sector is a part of it, but at the moment also the main part of it. And that's why we decided to, to prepare, to create this project and to start working together. So the project started in January 2022, so it's really fresh, fresh, the data are not so many, but the point of intervention were different. So one was to develop a multidisciplinary model of care that was including uh, psychiatric doctors, psychologists, internal medicine, infectious disease, sexual health, and social work support. We were trying during our meetings to handle the patient's problem from different point of views, uh, speak about the patients together and see if we required help from external experts. In this way, trying also to have to create a connection with other experts. So um, the, uh, we, we continued uh, meeting and speaking about the patients and we collected in total 29 patients. 29 patients that were using substance in a sexual contest. From these, we had already 15 patients, so 52% of them, they were already HIV positive. We controlled that they were taking correctly the therapy, and then we, um, we checked their viral load and they were all under control. Then there was two patients from these um, that uh, were on PrEP already. Um, all the patients, even if we were open for every kind of sexual orientation, in the end were MSM, so men having sex with men, with the age between 24 and 64. So from these, we saw that 93% used crystal meth, injected or smoked, 31% GHB, GBL, 27% cocaine, that's more typical in Switzerland, instead of methadone or designer drugs, it's mostly used cocaine, and 10% benzodiazepine. From these remain in the, in the group of patients, 14 patients who didn't, who didn't have PrEP or were not HIV positive. From these, we managed to take over on PrEP 11 from 14 of these patients. And 10 from 29 of the patients were at, the, at this, are at this point abstinent. So in conclusion, we can see that uh, interdisciplinary under the roof model can be used not only when it's uh, related to, to uh, substances like morphine derivates or OAT, but can also be used in, with a substance that are more in the excitant spectrum and with patients that have complexity and don't have the possibility of a substitution. And uh, the de develop further competence and establish guidelines in the context of an open innovative culture in which also the sexual part is uh, included in the, in the job uh, on caring of the patients. Thank you. I'm sorry that. Thank you very much, Claudia. So you're still here. That means that either you have questions or you lost hope in the Swiss salads that are served for lunch. <laughs> so we can take uh, uh, we can take uh, a question or two. As I said, this tablet doesn't work as much as we want to read the questions from the tab tablet. So uh, please. Um, thank you so much for for the wonderful presentations. Um, Basically, I'm Kennedy Mtale uh, from Decisive Minds in Zambia. And uh, my question is based on the, um, the presentation before this last presentation. So one thing that I've discovered in my country and basically in Africa is that uh, most of the problem, um, problems that we face, especially looking at the challenges of uh, communities that use drugs is a political, more a political problem. So my question is how best should the, 
our politicians be influenced to understand the importance of implementing you know, the programs. Because even in the area where you know, evidence can be produced, policies, some policies can also you know, come up, but in terms of implementation, we still face a lot of difficulties you know, as a country. And uh, how best should conferences like this be able to help in those areas? Thank you. Thank you. Please ask, uh, we, I saw two other hands, but please, very short questions, yeah? Because we're, <laughs> we see, exceeded the time, please. Go ahead, I, yeah. Thank you. Um, great panel, thanks so much. Uh, I think my question is uh, also builds up on that. So in terms of focusing on areas of research that we're not focusing enough on in this drug policy field, I'm wondering how much focusing on the human rights aspects of things is, is or has been effective in changing drug policy for the better. Thank you, and the last question, I saw your hand there. Uh, it's really brief, it's for Martin specifically. Um, is there any capacity or do you have any plans to, um, to uh, I guess, study other people's use of other drugs um, and the, the way that people use them uh, to, uh, well, yeah, to use other drugs rather than just cannabis? Thank you. So please, very, very briefly, yeah? <laughs> I guess one question is for... <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> honestly, I don't... So, the human rights question, I, honestly, I, I don't know what kind of research you'd do on human rights that would shift the agenda. I think a different way to create policy traction on human rights rather than research, which actually speaks to the first comment. I mean, research is only one input into policy. Um, and actually it's pretty marginal at the end of the day. Um, yes, you need it, it's kind of a necessary condition, but it's not the thing that changes policy. As we know, we've had fantastic evidence throughout this conference, that's not the thing. Maybe studying people's values um, is the way to go, which I actually had some slides on that as another policy area for research. But I, th I think the human rights agenda and I think um, getting policy traction is really about values rather than just about presenting the evidence. And Sioni, who was your question directed towards? Sorry, I was trying to be brief and manage to garble it instead. It was for Martin, specifically. And it was most, I guess, I've just found that research really interesting in the way that um, uh, people were uh, managing their own drug use and not having, um, not always having to work with um, clinicians um, to do so. Um, and I was just wondering if there was any opportunity, do you think, that you would be able to um, look at other, the way people manage other drugs as well beyond cannabis? Um, so, theoretically, yes, it may be possible. Uh, for example, um, in Marseille, we don't find heroin anymore. Um, people who inject prefer to be prescribed morphine because it's safer than the, uh, and easier to find. Um, another example, uh, I could do exactly the same project with psychedelics. Uh, there is a lot of, um, ma many people are, uh, many, Few people are self-medicating with um, psychedelics, so I could do exactly the same. Okay, so <laughs> I think we're going to stop here. We want to thank uh, all the speakers for the amazing presentations. I think work like this is helping all of us in our fields to move the agenda forward and have uh, better uh, laws. Uh, that will uh, enable the implementation of more interventions that will support uh, in many areas, the human rights, the health, uh, the access to services for people who, uh, who use drugs.